We turn now to Brussels, where world leaders are gathered for the first ever nuclear energy summit. It aims to highlight the power of nuclear energy in tackling the climate crisis and enhancing energy security. Our next guest, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, co-chaired the event, which is more urgent than ever given the wars and tensions that are happening around the world, such as Putin's invasion of Ukraine, and willingness to conduct military operations that threaten the massive nuclear power plants there. Just before the summit, Walter Isaacson spoke to Rafael Grossi about these serious safety concerns. Thank you, Christian and Rafael Grossi. Welcome back to the show. That's my pleasure. Hello. You recently met with uh, Russian President uh, Putin about the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant in Ukraine. It's one of it's the largest, I think, in Europe and Russia controls it. What were your concerns and what did President Putin say to you? Well, you know, this is part of my efforts, ongoing efforts, in fact, since the plant uh, was, you know, it came under the control uh, of the Russian Federation. So we have been working there. We have I have established a permanent presence of the IEA there. And as part of the uh, consultations we need to have, I was in Kiev as well. I met with the President Zelensky. And then, of course, I needed to go to the other side. Uh, and, you know, we discussed a number of things. We discussed some technical issues. You know, as you said, uh, this is the largest, the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe. Six big reactors, six gigawatts uh, of um, installed capacity there. Um, and many, of course, open questions, because we should never forget that this installation, this facility is exactly on the front line of the war. So it's not in the vicinity or somewhere here or it just in occupied territory. It's on the front line. It's quite dramatic in that sense. So we've had in the past situations of, uh, of uh, shelling at the plant. We've had several uh, blackouts and a blackout in a nuclear power plant, you know, is very dangerous because this would cut off a cooling uh, function, thereby potentially leading to a nuclear uh, accident. So there are many, many issues that we needed to discuss. And and you're referring to my last uh, trip to Sochi, in fact, in the south of Russia, where we had a long conversation with President Putin, and I could pass a number of messages, things that we believe that the that should be done there and also uh, look into the wider perspective of the plant, the situation of the plant, and other efforts to bring the situation to a more stable uh, pace. So you were in Sochi with President Putin, sitting with him for a while. Tell me, what was that like, and what else did he discuss? What did you make of his, his mindset now? Well, I must say, it's not my first time with him. Uh, since the war started, I, was, I had a year ago, more or less, another long meeting in St. Petersburg. And uh, these meetings, I must say, objectively speaking, speaking are very uh, professional, very thoughtful. He has a very, uh, um, you know, good understanding of uh, uh, nuclear technology. So it is possible to have a, a very, very, very focused conversation of uh, specific um, issues. Uh, related to the functioning of the plant, and also some others that are of a more general nature related to the situation there, the military situation around the plant, uh, and so on. So uh, he was, I would say, yes, it was, it was a very, very pointed and very meticulous technical conversation. You say he's very good at the technicalities of understanding the nuclear plant. How convinced are you that he would absolutely want to make sure there was no big accident at that plant or any of the others in Ukraine? Well, you know, it's a bit of a speculation, isn't it? But I, for me, one very basic, even one could say, uh, common sense rule tells us that a nuclear accident there would benefit no one, Ukraine, Russia, or the rest of Europe. So. It, it is, in this sense, for me, for my job, it is, um, it is easier to convince the leaders to do certain things or not to do other things 
in order to avoid situations that could scale up to uh, some confrontation um, around the planet, which would be, of course, extremely dangerous. A year ago, when you were talking to Krishan Amanpour on this show, you talked about trying to establish a zone of protection around right. the plant. How's that going? Well, I, that approach changed. I went to the United Nations Security Council a few months ago, and instead of trying to establish a delimitation with a territorial connotation, we moved into a behavioral sort of thing, basically in plain English, don't do this, do that, which is something that can be easily understood by everybody uh, at a time where the Security Council is a place where agreements are almost impossible to get. I got um, widespread, if not absolute support for this, which was not a proposal by the Russians or from the Ukrainians. It was something that the DG of the IEA was saying, this is what we need to do now if we want to avoid a nuclear accident. So it's a very clear set of criteria that need to be observed. And, and this is, I mean, this is the, the, what we had considered initially as a, a zone, a sanctuary, if you want, uh, around the plant bubble. Um, this, as I was saying, uh, at the front lines of a war is very, very difficult uh, to obtain. Military commanders on one hand, on the one side or the other, will very, you know, it will be very difficult to convince them to uh, not to operate there, to move there, to to do certain things. So I shifted my approach into certain things that needed to be avoided at all, at all costs. And of course, I don't want to jinx it, but so far we have been able to avoid the rest. Naturally, and I want to say this you know, very clearly, until we come to the end of this story, without a nuclear accident, I will never say that things are okay or stable or whatever, because they are simply not. And it's a day-by-day -day effort that we go through. You say things are not totally stable, that there's always some worry. What's your biggest worry? Well, I have two, basically. One is, of course, the possibility that there are always some episodes of a shelling of, of, of something. Now we have the, the, the appearance of the drones, and some drones are loaded with explosives. Um, so that is another, another threat that we are seeing. That is one. And the other, as I mentioned a minute ago, the blackout. So the possibility that the station is without any power, any external power supply, for a long period of time, then the emergency generators run out of fuel and then you have a meltdown. So that those scenarios are not impossible. Uh, and this is uh, what we need to, to avoid. And this is why we have our team there, a team of experts who is there, who is living there, uh, informing us by the minute what is the situation. You may have noticed that from Saporizia, you very rarely get fake stories or strange stories, and it's because the IEA is there. So we can say exactly what is happening. If somebody says we are being attacked or whatever, or the contrary, uh, fire is coming from the station, I have my guys there. So they are telling me exactly what's going on, what's going on on more technical aspects that would be perhaps a little bit boring to, to describe here. But uh, anyway, the important thing is that the IEA is there. We're not going anywhere until this comes to a better place. You say that experts from your agency are there. I think you've done a couple of rotations in the plant. What do you do when you're there? What's it like? Well, there normally what we do is, uh, when, when I personally go, the people there, they, they have a daily routine. They go through, you know, um, uh, a nuclear power plant, especially one with six reactors. It's a huge site, very, very big site. Um, uh, where there are many safety functions that we need to check that are being performed well. We need to check the water levels uh, of the cooling function. We need to go to the control rooms and see how this is going. So we have a, like a checklist, if you want, that we have to uh, go through uh, every day. When I go, uh, of course, 
I, I have the opportunity to meet with the management and then we can raise more general issues as well. President Putin has threatened or hinted that he might actually use nuclear weapons or tactical battlefield nuclear weapons uh, in this war, especially, I would guess, if the red lines like Crimea uh, were attacked. How likely is it and what would trigger that, do you think? Well, you know that the use of nuclear weapons by the five uh, countries that are legitimate possessors of nuclear weapons, basically the five permanent members of the Security Council, including the United States, according to the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, these countries have these this mm. nuclear weapons. And what these countries normally have is a doctrine, certain principles, scenarios, mm. according to which they would resort to using nuclear weapons. Uh, normally, they are not so dissimilar, I would say, and normally they are associated with the obvious things, you know, being attacked with nuclear weapons, or in a more, I would say, general sense, uh, being under an existential threat that would make the possessor of a nuclear weapon uh, uh, use it. Um, so. Uh, this is the situation. This is valid. This has been reiterated by, by all. At the same time, I, I wish to remind that these same countries said and repeated that uh, famous old formula that I think was uttered by uh, Secretary General Gorbachev and President Reagan, that a nuclear war um, can never be won and must never be fought. So if you unleash a nuclear conflict, the, the logic of it could very easily uh, lead us to total destruction. So um, my impression is that there would be restraint. Of course, there are some uh, statements uh, which are regrettable. I would not get into that, of course, as head of an international organization. But what I'm giving you is the parameters, the parameters that do exist and that we hope will be respected. When you talk about those parameters, you just said something, which is if the country faces an existential threat, meaning a threat to its existence, do you think Crimea is an existential issue for uh, Russia? I wouldn't go into that. First of all, Crimea is an occupied territory, of course, according to international law. Um, so um, frankly speaking, for me to indicate what could be at that point where Russia would resort to nuclear weapons would be imprudent. Um, I would simply say nuclear weapons have no place in general, but in particular, in, par in particular, in this conflict, um, I don't see them uh, being used. I hope this will be the case. President Putin has said that he's pulling out of the New START Treaty, which is a longstanding strategic arms uh, treaty on nuclear mm -hmm. weapons between East and West. Uh, what do you think the implications of that are, and is there any way to prevent that? Well, I think the implications of that is that the uh, arms, arms control, as opposed to disarmament, the arms control structures that prevail uh, between, you said the West, I would say the United States and, and uh, the Russian Federation um, are being eroded and uh, the processes that led to this dialogue that existed and the control reductions in those arsenals, which reached in the 1970s and the 1980s incredible proportions, um, uh, will cease to be reduced, which is not, uh, of course, uh, a good thing. I think in general, what we can say is that as soon as possible, there should be a return to this, um, to this dialogue under this form, could be the start, the new start, or any uh, kind of agreement that may exist. But it is clear that um, the number of nuclear weapons must be, must be reduced and ultimate, uh, eliminated completely. But we know that it is not for tomorrow. For the past 50 years, this whole notion of having a nuclear arms uh, negotiation process, whether it was START or SALT or the Intermediate Nuclear uh, Weapons Force treaties, it wasn't just about the outcome of those treaties. It was a process where the sides sat down and tried to negotiate nuclear arms. 
now we don't have this process. Is there any way you think we can restart at least negotiations about nuclear arms for just for the sake of having these conversations again? Well, it's an excellent point. I think that uh, the contacts and, and dialogue are uh, indispensable. Look at, I mean, narrowing, if you allow me, the spectrum to what we are doing at the moment as the IEA, we are the only conduit for some type of conversation between Kiev and Moscow. Uh, so, because there's no direct conversation. There was some in the, be the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the war, uh, in early, in the spring of 2022, then thereafter, no, no process uh, took place. And what we are seeing now, again, uh, at the level of the superpowers, uh, is following that that logic of talking past each other, um, and and sometimes in an increasingly alarming uh, tone. So uh, the the uh, there is a need, of course, always uh, for for diplomacy. There was a senior uh, official in President Biden's administration who recently said that right now is when the uh, nuclear risk is most at the forefront. Uh, do you agree with that? And if so, why? Well, uh, I think uh, what we have been discussing uh, here uh, would be a confirmation of the general validity of that assertion. We are in a world where uh, dialogue among the superpowers is broken down. Uh, we see uh, uh, more nuclear weapons, more nuclear weapons being produced. We have a direct confrontation, war at the heart of Europe. We also see and hear then closer to my own mission, which is non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. We see countries toying, playing with the idea of developing their own nuclear weapons on top of the nuclear weapons we already have. So the configuration um, is extremely uh, concerning uh, for us. Of course, we, uh, from our perspective, of course, I cannot um, talk uh, about things that are, you know, beyond my mandate. But on our side, and the area of uh, preventing proliferation of nuclear weapons, we are extremely active. I have just returned from a tour in the Middle East. I was in Baghdad. I was in Syria. I have an open process with Iran, as you may know. Uh, so we are trying to reinforce the norms of non-proliferation wherever uh, we can so that the, uh, the, the landscape doesn't get any uh, bleaker than it already is. Rafael Grossi, thank you so much for joining it's us. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much.